Hey, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Come on in, grab a seat, and uh, we'll get going here. Glad you made it out in this nice, chilly morning. Sun's out. The sun's in. Amen. Isn't that cool when you go to see the Lord? He's always in. He doesn't like put a sign out that says, sorry, out to lunch. Everybody else is out to lunch, but God's not. He's in. He's in the house, and so we're grateful for that. Let's pray and, and ask God to just meet us here. Father, we give you praise today because of who you are. And, Lord, we know that you have a plan for today. We know that you are working in us and through us, and uh, we're working on us. And today we're just yours. We just want to make sure that we are surrendered and, and committed to you. So would you just come today by your Holy Spirit and uh, just meet with us, whatever it is that, that you would like to say or do. We would say, God, be, be free to do that. Um, just come and, and speak to us through the word and Come and share your heart with us, Lord. And uh, may we just find fellowship in, in worship today as we are here for you. And the songs are for you and they're about you. And, and it doesn't really make uh, much sense to come and do this unless you're here with us. And we know that you are, Jesus. You promise that even if there's just a couple gathered together, uh, you're right there among them. And so we know you're here and how that should change our perspective that we've just walked into this place and in the body of Christ coming together like this, Jesus, you are right here with us and uh, we love you today and we want to have this time be really glorious for you, full and rich. And so we just invite that, Lord, we invite you here. Be blessed today. Be honored in this place. It's our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand. Oh, 
And you can go ahead and have a seat, and uh, we're going to have the brothers come and just receive today's offering. Let's just pray over that. God, we're grateful that we have so much, um, and it's uh, obviously because you've been good and providing for us. So this is an act of worship for us, God. Uh, I know that's how you desire it to be, just something that you put on our hearts to give, and so we just want to give that way and not under pressure or constraint somehow or having to, to kind of do this out of duty or obligation, but just as a free will offering, a love offering, God, to you, just um, desiring to just give you all of ourselves. And, uh, so whatever you've placed there on our hearts, may we give that and uh, do it with a heart of cheerfulness and gladness, God, that's how you like it. And uh, so that's, I pray, how we give. And we commit that to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
that you are the God that, that we adore. You're the one that has our heart. And we don't give that to anyone else. We don't bow before another. We don't lift our hands to other things, to, to things that are false, that don't have power, that don't have life. God, you're the only one. And so we, we worship you today. We desire for you to be honored and glorified. So take this time, Lord, that we've made, set aside for you to just do everything in this place and in our hearts and in this church that you see fit to do. And we will say amen to that. But we do love you. Jesus, we love you. you you're the one that has our hearts. You're our heart's desire. And uh, I pray that we would just really begin to, to perhaps see that in a deeper way even today. That you're so good. That you have everything we need. And um, we just love you for that. And so as we study your word and get ready for that, God, prepare our hearts. Help us to listen. Help us to take in, Lord, what you're saying today. Because you speak to each one of us. If we but listen, you will speak. And we can glean things for our life today. Something perhaps specifically for us. I pray your spirit moves through the word and direct each thing, Lord, that happens in this place today. And we commit that to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, greet some folks, will you? And say hi. And Okay, you probably had enough time to say hi to everyone in the sanctuary. Hey, good to see you today. Is it good to see me? Okay, thanks. Just didn't want this to be a one-sided thing. Well, it is good to see you. It's a, it's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord with the saints and singing praises to God. And just uh, being with you and being with the Lord, it's just a rich, rich thing. I'm glad we get to do this as often as we do. Uh, quick announcements just uh, for you to take in. Uh, there's a single 
ladies uh, art paint party March 28th at noon um, at Roots and Wings Studio in Bandon. And a light lunch is going to be served. You can sign up in the foyer. Space is limited. Women 18 and older and single. Just as a kind of discrimination, I think. <laughs> I don't know if this is politically correct. <laughs> but then again, we have the Oregon's Men Conference coming up next, next Saturday with Daniel Fusco. Um, and we're, we're, we're still planning on doing that conference. There was some talk about maybe not doing it, but we'll let everybody know. But as of now, uh, we're doing that. You can, you can carpool or you can see John France if you're interested in riding on the church van. Although, keep in mind, he'll probably have high school guys on the van. So you may want to rethink that. <laughs> or not. I mean, yeah. There's a ladies fellowship at Joyce Harden's tomorrow morning, 10.30 a.m. And uh, you can see the information back on the slot wall or talk to Joyce about that if you like. Awesome. Well, good. We are... Um, Plowing through 2 Kings, we're in chapter 14 this morning. Interesting time in Israel's history, these days of the kings. You know, at the, by the end of this chapter, we, we're going to have talked about eight different kings just in recent teachings. <clears throat> Five of them were evil. So out of eight kings mentioned lately, five of them were bad news. And that's just the way it is. It, it was that way throughout Israel's history over the ages. And it's still that way today. Out of all the rulers that, that take office in different parts of the world today, many of them are rotten. <laughs> Why is that? Because man is rotten. Man's a sinner. And what do you expect when sinners try and lead and run things? Well, it's going to be ugly. And that's the way it is most of the time. And Israel was no different. They were experiencing ugly times because of the wickedness and evil that was allowed to be present, not only in the country, but among God's own people. It's one thing when the country is going in a direction that's obviously ungodly. It's another thing when God's people join in and are going that way. And, you know, God expects the, the world out there, so to speak, to go that way because that's all they know. And uh, he, he deals with them, but really the, the thing that he shows himself to be angered by is when his people turn and go that way because we are in a relationship with God. The world isn't. They have no relationship with him. And it's different when you're in a relationship with someone, isn't it? It's more responsibility. There's more accountability. And so God expects us to be accountable to him and, and go the way that he's asking us to for our own good, but also for his glory. And so there's purposes, there's reasons why we do what God says. It's, it's right. It's the thing that, that keeps us out of trouble, but it also blesses our life. Um, and so God had this this thing going on with the people of Israel constantly, and now there's two different nations, really, Israel and Judah, because of rebellion and division. And we saw last week how, you know, Elisha, before he, before he passes off the scene, he has this encounter with, uh, with the king, remember. Um, it, it was, it's, you can read through that briefly if you want to, but... It's interesting because um, Jehoash, who was the king at that point of Israel, he went to see Elisha on his deathbed. And Elisha, remember, hearing the king talk about the things and how things were going, he said to him, grab that bow and those arrows, remember? And he said, shoot an arrow. And, and Elisha put his hands right on top of the hands of Jehoash, and he said, shoot that arrow. And he shot an arrow towards the east. And Elisha said, that is the arrow of God's deliverance. And he said, now take 
the rest of those arrows and shoot. And so he did. He grabbed that, that quiver of arrows and he shot three arrows. And Elisha got mad. <laughs> he got angry. He said, why did you only shoot three arrows? Why didn't you shoot five or six or whatever was in the bag? Remember? And it speaks of how often we do this. God has given us arrows to shoot. And how many arrows do we actually shoot? And that determined whether or not Israel was going to be victorious one, two, three, four, five, however many times you shoot the arrow, that's how many times you'd be victorious. He did three, therefore at the end of the chapter, it says they were victorious three times. How many times do we want to be victorious? More than three times for sure. Three times, I, I can't even get out of bed. After, I need three arrows just to get up out of bed in the morning. Amen? Lord, help me. Lord, help me get up, <laughs> right? I need to shoot an arrow. I need to shoot an arrow again, right? And then I come and, and meet with you guys. I need bunches of arrows for that. <laughs> I, Lord, give me some arrows to shoot. But the arrows are plentiful. The shooters are few. Just like Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There's always this imbalance ratio that God gives so much and God's people do so little. And so we can see, as long as you want victory, just keep shooting the arrows. And that can just mean doing what God has asked you to do, speak to him, pray for them, you know, get together with that person, encourage that person, be there for that, rebuke that guy. I don't know, whatever it is, it's an arrow to shoot that God has ordained for you to use. So we saw that, okay, they, they had three victories because they shot he shot three arrows. Great lesson there. Now, moving into chapter 14, tells us about the reign of Amaziah over Judah, who is the son there of Jehoash. And it says, in the second year of Joash, son of Jehoaz, king of Israel, he reigned, and Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah. So he was 20 and five years old when he began to reign and he reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jehodan of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And we always say, yay, <laughs> a king that's doing right in the sight of the Lord. But watch what it says right after that. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David, his father, or his great-great-grandfather. Isn't it a bummer when you're a king in Israel? And every time you do something, you're compared to David. You know what I mean? Like David, like he's the greatest king of Israel. Like any king after him is like, yeah, he's okay. It's not like David. And he wasn't like David. David, you know, was, was not perfect by any means, but he had a heart for God. And he wouldn't put up with idolatry in the land. David was serious about his relationship with God. So this guy did that which was right, but not like David, his father, but he did according to all the things as, as Joash, his father, did. So he followed in his father's footsteps, but not in David's so much. And we know that his father did not take care of all the things that needed to take place in that time, which was dealing with the idolatrous high places. He didn't remove them. And so following in his father's step, footsteps, verse 4 says, Howbeit the high places were not taken away. This is the place where people go up on the hillsides around Jerusalem and around the hills of Samaria, and they would practice perversity. These high places were supposedly places where you could go out and offer sacrifices, but really what it was was there were orgies going on up there, and there was just sick stuff happening. And that's why people wanted to keep the high places. They were really low places, morally low, but they called them the high places, pretending they could go up there and offer a sacrifice and really just get into a perverted situation. So it wasn't that he took away the high places. He left them just as his dad did, and, and as yet the people 
did sacrifice and burn incense on the high places. You leave the high places and people are going to use them. What a word this is, right? Some of us have high places. Some of us have some things in our life that we would have to call high places. They're not godly things. They're ungodly things. And if you leave them in place, you will use them. Right? You can't, you can't keep certain things around without using them. So whatever it is, get rid of it. And get rid of it to a, a point that you can't get it back, right? Somebody says, I, I can't help doing this thing. You know, I, I can't help looking at this stuff. And my response is, well, break the computer. Break it. Well, I'm not going to, I mean, that cost me 500 but I'm not going to break it. It's costing you a lot more than that, spiritually. If you can't handle it, get rid of it, you know. Some of, some of you are addicted to certain things. You can't keep that stuff around. You'll use it, you know. As a former drunk alcohol, I can't keep stuff in my liquor cabinet. I don't even have a liquor cabinet. Got rid of the liquor cabinet. Can't keep stuff there. Not, not that I necessarily want it right now, but why would I have it there? And that's a question you have to ask. Why have a high place in your life if you're not planning on using it? If you're addicted to drugs, you can't keep drugs. Well, I just sit in the cabinet. I don't use it. Why would you have it? Why have something you don't use? That was the point. So they burnt incense and sacrifices up there. And it came to pass, as soon as the kingdom was confirmed in his hand, that he slew his servants which had slain the king, his father. So remember that, that this man, uh, his dad, it's Amaziah, his dad, was killed by his own servants. Um, it was kind of a, a plot to take him out. And so this son of his, as soon as he comes into power, he went to those servants that killed his dad, and he killed them. Now, not just for revenge, but for the future. If these guys killed my dad... What would stop them from killing me? So self-preservation as well as revenge, perhaps, but it gets rid of a potential problem, and no one could blame the king for doing this. But watch what it says here, and this is going to require just a little thought as we get into this discussion. He says he, he took out the, the, the ones that slew his father, but verse 6 says the children of the murderers he slew not according unto that which is written in the book of the law of Moses, wherein the Lord commanded, saying, The father shall not be put to death for the children, nor the children be put to death for the fathers, but every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Now, you're not to blame for your father's sins, and fathers aren't to blame for their son's sins. Oh, they could influence them, but ultimately everyone stands on their own. And you're not judged for another person's sin. And I'm glad for that, you know. You're not judged for my sin. I'm not judged for your sin. But here's the thing. This, this comes up often in conversation in, in the church. And some people have bought into this idea that there is generational curses, that because a family came from this background and all these things happened in that family, well, then there's a generational curse now, and then the kids are going to go through the same thing, and the grandkids are going to be, it's just this endless cycle. We're cursed as a family. I've heard people say, I'm under a generational curse. No, you're not. There is no such thing. The only one who wants you to believe that you're under a generational curse is Satan. He wants people to believe they're under a generational curse. He'd love for every generation to be cursed. 
But God doesn't want anyone to even think that that's possible. And this is a, this is a quote that he, he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 24. And I'm going to read it to you because this is back in the days of the, when the law was given and when Moses was passing out the ordinances, it says this in chapter 24, Deuteronomy, verse 16. This is what he quoted. The fathers shall not be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sins. Now, that's the direct quote. But I think it's interesting that in Ezekiel chapter 18, which is far later, far after this, that Ezekiel elaborates a little bit on that law and the interpretation of it. Um, and he says, beginning with verse uh, 19 um, of Ezekiel chapter 18, he says, Yet say ye, why doth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? Why is it that the son doesn't have to bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right, hath kept all my statutes and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked will turn from his sins that he hath committed and keep my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. All transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. And watch what it says here. Verse 23 says, Have I any pleasure at all? All that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God. Does God like, take pleasure when wicked people are judged and condemned to hell? No. And not that he should return from his ways and live. Does God not want people to repent? Yes, of course he does. But what it's saying here diffuses absolutely the idea that someone is carrying on in a family that's been kind of going through this stuff morally that they're under the curse now and they can't break free. That's just a lie. So if you ever hear that, take, take whoever it is you're talking with. If someone brings it up and says, well, you're, you know, you're probably under a generational curse. No, I'm not. And you can go right to Deuteronomy 24. You can go to Ezekiel 18 and just say, hey, this is not possible to have a generational curse. So it is, however, and this should be said, it is possible that you will influence your children to a point where they'll have to go through difficulty and your effect on them is pretty radical as parents. We have a pretty radical effect on our kids. We do. And so that needs to be considered, but a kid is not paying for the sins of his father and, and the Father's not paying for the sins of his child. At some point, they, they, they're on their own, and they do their own thing. Everybody gets dealt with for their own life, for their own sin. So he didn't slay the kids, which I think was the right thing, and I believe the word of God here being quoted spoke to him in that regard. So he did, though, it goes on and says, he slew of Edom in the Valley of Salt 10,000 and took Selah, by war and called the name of it Jokthiel unto this day. Jokthiel means subdued by God. He called a place where he had victory over 10,000 in Edom, basically is where this took place. He called the place subdued by God. In other words, God gave us this victory to subdue the enemy. So Jokthiel is a good name for a place that you just won a battle in. So we all have some jock feels, don't we? A place that we had victory. That's what that means. We, we subdued, so to speak, the enemy. He, he didn't get us. We took him out. So having that victory, now watch this, because it, it's interesting that, that Amaziah, who is now this king over Judah, 
Amaziah feels pretty pretty good about having that victory. Like, we, yeah, we went in there and subdued those guys. We called it Jock Deal. Where are you from? Jock Deal. I mean, this is where they were at. So then Amaziah, in his kind of condition being a little puffed up, sent messengers to Jehoaz, the son of Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, come, let us look one another in the face. Or let's get together and face to face. Let's deal with what we're going to deal with. In other words, picking a fight. Picking a fight with, with Israel, the northern tribes. And then Jehoash, the king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, king of Judah, saying, you know, the thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, give thy daughter to my son and to wife. And there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon and trode down the thistle. Now, he throws this little titty out there, right? Little, little unique little fairy tale, so to speak, saying, you know, there was a thistle, which is just a little weed. It's a little weed that, that declared to the cedar in Lebanon. Now, a thistle, a weed versus a big cedar tree. And obviously, he's drawing reference to the fact that Judah is the thistle and that they're the, the big cedar of Lebanon. And, of course, this wild animal just trods by and destroys the thistle. But the wild animal can't do anything to the cedar too big and powerful. So he's just using this little, hey, guess what? Guess who you are in this little story? You're the thistle picking a fight with a cedar, and some stray little animal could go by and totally destroy you. I, we won't even have to fight you, right? He says, you know, he goes on and says, you know, thou hast indeed smitten Adam, and thine heart hath lifted thee up. I know you're pretty proud of taking on Adam, but we're not Adam, he's saying. And you're pretty proud of taking on Adam. He says, go ahead and glory of this and tarry at home. Go ahead. Hey, have your glorious victory over Adam, but you just need to go home after that. You don't want to mess with us, is what he's saying. Why, he says, shouldest thou meddle to thy hurt? In other words, why do you want to mess around with us and get wiped out he says, thou and, and you, your people, he says, why should you meddle to your hurt that thou shouldest fall, even thou and Judah with thee? You're going to take out more people uh, than you're going to be comfortable with by your bad decision here. You should just take your glory and go home. But victory oftentimes can blind us. It's a good thing, but it can cause you to have a confidence that's misplaced. Um, there's no indication here that Amaziah sought after God's counsel. He just assumed because he had victory at Edom that he would go ahead and take on now Israel, the northern tribes of Israel, just because he had a victory over here. And you could say, well, that makes sense, right? You're on a roll. That roll thing. You ever, ever think you're on a roll? It's kind of the time when you kind of roll off the table. I'm on a roll. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> and this is kind of where he's headed. He doesn't ask God, so, Lord, you gave us that victory at Jock Thiel. You, do, you, do you want us to go ahead and, and keep taking victory? Should, should we fight against Israel? No, no prayer. Didn't ask him. Just said, we're picking another fight. And the king of Israel was trying to warn him off, but he wouldn't listen. And he's stubborn in this. You know, he, he, he hears from this king of, of Israel, you're out of your league. You're over your head. You don't want to mess with me. You don't want to mess with our, our country. We have a bigger army. We're more powerful. You don't want to mess around with us. But he doesn't have real faith here. He's only concerned about his reputation. So for him to challenge the, the king of Israel and then the king of Israel to say, you know, you're going to get squashed, the pride in a man rises up, doesn't it? Oh, really? Right? Now, now, now it's just a, a back and forth thing going, oh, yeah? Well, how about this? <laughs> right? And he's, he's just working this 
because he doesn't want to look bad in front of his whole nation. I mean, he, he picked a fight with Israel. He's going he's gonna to finish the fight. So this is what he does. Amaziah, verse 11, wouldn't hear. Therefore, Jehoash, king of Israel, went up, and he and Amaziah of Judah looked one another in the face at Beth Shemesh, which belongeth to Judah. So they have a face-off, right? Get right face-to-face. -face. You really want to do this? You really want to fight? Yes, we are. We're fighting you right now. I mean, the whole thing's settled. And then it says, and Judah was put to the worst before Israel. And they fled every man to their tents. They got smeared. You ever been smeared? We used to call it that when we were kids in school, right? We're going to smear you. It's just a, it's just a term that, it, that kind of reminds you of peanut butter going over white bread. I'm going to smear you. <laughs> right? And it's pretty effective, right? It sounds like it. But they got smeared. Not because God wanted them to get smeared, but because God let them get smeared. Because doing something away from what God's will is, it, it is going to lead to not victory, but defeat. And God allows it. You ever ask God, why didn't you give me victory there? Because you did that on your own. You have no victory on your own. What were you thinking? I hear that from God more times than I'd like to admit. What? What were you thinking? What were you thinking doing that? Well, Lord, I thought I could just, yeah, see, there's the problem. You thought. You're not supposed to think for yourself. You're supposed to come to me and let me counsel you and let me direct you. So there they are. They got smeared, and here's what happens next. Verse 13, Jehoash, king of Israel, took Amaziah, king of Judah, and the son of Jehoash, the son of Ahaziah, at, at Beth Shemesh, and came to Jerusalem and break down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim unto the corner gate, 400 cubits, about 600 feet of the wall around Jerusalem was destroyed by Israel, by the northern tribes. Now, why would they do that? Well, for one thing, destroying part of their wall gave Israel access into the city so they could plummet it and take the spoil, which you'll see here they did. But also, taking out that much of the wall, they could not easily, quickly rebuild, which meant 600 feet of open wall meant the enemies of Israel could also come and invade. So they've opened the way to a lot more of the enemy's ability to work in their life. Now, the, the, the message here is very obvious to me, that the pride that, that Amaziah displayed, you know, I had this victory, so we're going to take you on, and, and he didn't listen to reason, he didn't ask God, and so this defeat leaves him with a, a, a defeat, and his walls have now been taken down, and now he's given the enemy just that much more ability to work in his life. And this is what we do when we do it ourselves. <laughs> the enemy's not afraid of you. He's afraid of God. And if you're working with God, then he has fear. If you're not working with God, he's doing backflips because he knows you're, you're, you're not going to able, be able to hold up. So the 600 feet of wall destroyed. Now all kinds of enemies can come in. There's been seasons of my life where the walls around my life have been destroyed from pride, from trying to do things my, myself, trying to do it my way. And all I've done is allowed the enemy more access into those areas. Anybody else have that reality going on sometimes? It's like, Whoa. <laughs> and what was it? Why, why was it? Well, it was because of pride. It was because I think I still have some ability to do things. There's nowhere in Scripture where God says, well, I'm just going to leave this to you. 
you, you just go ahead and take care of that. <laughs> no, God always says, you're going to need me. Make sure you come see me. Make sure we're on the same page, and I will go before you. I will fight this battle for you. You, you can just bring up the rear. If, if you follow me, if you follow what I'm saying, we're going to have victory. And, and there's times when, when you just know the Lord's going, where are you going? Hey, whoa, what, what, right? What are you doing over there? We're out there, I'm taking on this, and I'm doing this, man. You know, he got smeared. And then what? And then we cry out to God, oh, Lord, such a victim. Suffering for Jesus. Here I am out there fighting the battle. I got whipped. You got whipped because you did it yourself. There's victims and there's victors. Which one do we want to be? Right? Victims are always complaining about, ah, oh, this didn't work, and that didn't work, and I don't know, this thing being a Christian, man, it's hard, and life is just difficult, and everything comes against me. I'm just a mess all the time. My guess is you're not hanging with God. You're, you're going out on your own. Can't do it. So watch what happens next. So now all the wall is broken down from, from the corner gate to Ephraim gate. And, and it, it says that then Israel, he, he took all the gold and silver and all the vessels that were found in the house of the Lord. He took all the treasure of the of the the house of God. And, and then he took the treasures of the king's house and he took hostages and he returned to Samaria. So he just came in, did what he wanted to do, took everything that he wanted and just ran off with it. Went back to Samaria. He didn't stick around to oppress the people of Jerusalem. He just destroyed things, ripped off all their money, took some hostages and then went back. Do you see a problem here with the decision of Amaziah to fight a fight that he was not anointed to, to fight, but he made a decision to do it anyway? It didn't just affect him. There were others. The treasure of the house of the Lord was the people's. That was their treasure, and it's all gone. The treasure of the king's house, that's all gone. He would be using that for the nation as well. So the provision for the people has now just been wiped out. There is no provision. And there's hostages taken and all the rest. So my decisions, folks, are not just going to affect me. So when people say, well, listen, it's my choice, it's my decision, well, that's going to have an effect on others. Nobody chooses anything just for themselves. It's always going to have an effect on others, right? It just is. We never sin alone. We never make decisions that only affect us. We are connected. And whether it's your kids, your family, or the church, aren't we all pretty painfully aware of this truth in some way or another? Have we made decisions sometimes in our life that have affected other people? Are there hostages? Are there people in bondage because of decisions we've made? Are people more free and living a life that's more rich in the Lord because of decisions we make? Or is it another reality that we made this decision and, ooh, this had a real adverse effect? There's people being held hostage because of that decision. So this king, his pride was now destroying his own nation. And the nation was a mess. It really was. Um, 
I'll read this next verse, and then we need to jump over to Second Chronicles here in a second. But watch this. He says, Now the rest of the acts of Jehoash, which he did, and his might, and how he fought with Amaziah, king of Judah, are, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings? And the answer is, of course, yes, they are. And in Second Chronicles 25, this is where we pick up this parallel story. Um, I think it's important to read what happened here in a little more detail because it just kind of says, well, all this other stuff happened, kind of you figure it out. Well, we don't have to figure it out. We just move to another part of Scripture. And in, in 2 Chronicles 25, let's, let's begin at verse 5. It's going to tell us about the rest of this kind of story, so this encounter with Amaziah and the king of Israel and how all this destruction happened. But let's see a little deeper into the story how this came about. So verse 5 says, Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and made them captains over thousands and captains over hundreds, according to the houses of their fathers throughout all Judah. And Benjamin, and, and he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them 300,000 choice men able to go forth to war that could handle spear and shield. Hey, 300,000 in your army, that's pretty impressive, Right? But it says in verse 6, he hired also a hundred, a thousand mighty men of valor out of Israel for a hundred talents of silver. He went outside his own country and hired another hundred thousand mercenaries, basically, men that fight for hire. So they're not part of Israel, they're outsiders, and he hires them as well. That wasn't told to us in the previous chapter. So now you're, you're pretty much teaming up. You're not only doing this on your own, Amaziah, but now you're teaming up with those that would be the enemy normally. So it's, it's one little slip to go on my own away from God, and then the next thing you know, I'm actually incorporating some of the enemy's weaponry in how I'm going to do this. So this is what happens. But there came a man of God. Ah, God always sends somebody. You ever notice this? You're about to do something stupid. <laughs> and God sends somebody. And, you know, bless their heart, whoever they are. Some people will come and say, I just got a word. <laughs> I just need to speak into your life right now. What? Sometimes we don't want to hear. Like, I don't need to hear this. But he sent a man of God to him, saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel to wit with all the children of Ephraim. But if thou wilt go, do it, be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy, for God hath power to help and to cast down. You shouldn't do this, he says in the first place. You shouldn't be going into this battle because God hasn't appointed it to be so. And if you go you're going to fall because God can make you have victory or he can cause you defeat. He can do either one. And, and does God let me be defeated sometimes? Yes. I'm never defeated, though, if I'm doing it his way. I'm only defeated when I'm, when I'm not. And so he tells him, you're going you're gonna to fall here. But if you're going to go, know that, that I told you. I mean, at least I, as I said something to you. And Amaziah said to the man of God, but what shall we do for the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? I, who, what about these mercenaries? I paid them like a hundred talents of silver. I paid them money already. They've already got some money of mine. And the man of God answered, well, the Lord is able to give thee much more than this. <laughs> Ooh, now that's a faith statement. I just gave money to these guys. Now what am I, am I getting a refund? No, mercenaries don't give refunds. <laughs> They're not going to give you a refund. Well, what about all that money I lost? Forget it. God's able to, to give you much more than that. You know, we used to have that, that phrase, where God guides, God provides. And it's true. If God wants you to do this, don't worry about that. He'll take care of it. He'll provide for you. Again, that's a faith issue. 
But Amaziah's like, wow, I don't know what the money, man. I, I wasted money. What well, was your waste? <laughs> you know, you hired these guys. God can make more money. <laughs> you know, sometimes people say, what are we going to do if this happens? What are we going to do with that? Or how is this going to work? Hey, I don't know. <laughs> I tell people, what's our long-range goals at the church? What's that? What's a long-range goal? Okay, what about short-range goals? What's that? Okay, here's our, here's our short-range goal. We're here today. <laughs> God's providing. We're doing all right. <clears throat> well, don't you have a, a budget? I don't think God's on a budget. Is he? I like to show me in the Bible. Well, God says, watch it. I'm going to run out. If you're not careful, you, we're all going to run out of money. I can't. See, God's not like us. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, meaning he owns everything. Can God just drop the finances in our lap if he wants to? Of course, he, and he's done it many times over the years. People say, how'd you get this church started? I didn't. I didn't know what I was doing. I still don't. That might be disconcerting for you. Like, he doesn't have a plan. You're right. Here's my plan. God's in control. God wants us to have something. He can provide for it. You, we don't have to freak out, right? Hey, listen, if I thought for a second that I had to come up with some kind of plan to keep making this thing work, then I would freak out. I'd be freaked out then. But if God's got this, it's his thing. You know, I was, Lord, if you want this thing to fall apart, go ahead. It's yours. If you want it to do well, then great. If you want us to do this, you're going to need to provide for it because we don't know how to do it. You with me? Does that scare you? <laughs> Some of you are like, I don't know about this church. <laughs> what do they do there? They trust God. I don't know. It's freaky. <laughs> God is able, the man of God says, to provide much more than this. That 100,000, I mean, don't worry about it. God's got this covered. Huh. So, then Amaziah, and I'm still in 2 Chronicles 25, verse 10. Then Amaziah separated them to wit the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again. He sent those mercenaries home. Okay, guys, don't really need your services anymore so you guys can just leave and if you want to leave that hundred thousand talents here that'd be awesome no it doesn't say that it says this though wherefore their anger these mercenaries their anger was greatly kindled against judah and they returned home in great anger why they they got money and didn't even have to fight two things i think they like to fight they're mercenaries. Secondly, the bigger reward of battle was the spoil that you took. Much more than the money that you get paid to fight, you get to keep the spoils of war, which is a fortune. So they know we're not getting any spoils. So what do they do? So they go home in great anger, and Amaziah strengthened himself. Note that. Who strengthened Amaziah? himself and led forth his people and went to the valley of salt and smote the children of Seir, 10,000. That's Edom. We already read that in the other part that we just got through with. And other 10,000 left alive he, the children of Judah, carried away captive and brought them unto the top of the rock and cast them down from the top of the rock that they were all broken in pieces. Ooh. This wasn't told to us back in 2 Kings 14. It says that he killed 10,000 in Edom, and that's it. No, he took another 10,000 people and led them up to the top of a cliff and pushed them off. 10,000 of them. And they 
broken pieces. So this is gross, isn't it? They, so this isn't mentioned. This is why we need the whole counsel here of God, because we wouldn't know this unless we jumped over here to, to Second Chronicles. But he was really mean. He took that victory, and then he takes people, innocent people, and just throws them off the cliff. God didn't tell him to do that. He did that on his own. He strengthened himself and then went and destroyed people. This is what happens. Listen, this is what happens when you rely on your own strength. You cause harm. It's not just that you don't have victory. You cause harm in people's lives. The harm that happens to other people is because someone is relying on themselves. All the atrocities that have taken place in our history as a, as a humankind, so to speak, as mankind, all the atrocities because someone strengthened themselves. And God wasn't in on it. So this is what he did. We didn't know that before. Huh? But the soldiers of the army which Amaziah sent back, now these guys that were mad that they should not go with him to battle, they fell upon the cities of Judah from Samaria even unto Beth Horon and smote 3,000 of them and took much spoil. <laughs> they were mad. We didn't get to fight. We didn't get to take the spoil. So on the way home, we're going to stop in the, some of these cities in Judah and, and wipe them out and take the spoil from there. This is what kind of guys they were. Now it came to pass after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites that he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods. Oh, we didn't hear that before either. So after the Edomites were defeated, he brought back the gods of, of the Edomites and set them up and bowed down himself before them and burned incense unto them. Ooh. This guy's getting worse by the minute. Wherefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah, and he sent unto him a prophet, which said unto him, Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? Good question. Here, here's the, here's the million-dollar question. Amaziah, you went and defeated the Edomites on your own in your own strength, and then you threw others off a cliff in your mean and, and wicked way, and then you brought back the gods that they worshipped that couldn't help them when you attacked them. You brought those gods back and set them up and worshipped them. What is wrong with you? <laughs> those gods couldn't help them, and you're going to worship them? Because I mean, what is the matter with you? And this is the sickness of idolatry, worshiping something that cannot help you in any way, shape, or form, and putting your trust in something that will never, ever be able to help. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against him, it says, and the, the prophet says, why did you do that? They, those gods couldn't help the people. And it came to pass as, as he talked with him that the king said unto him, Art thou made of the king's council? <laughs> he looks at this prophet and says, so, like, are you one of the counselors of the king or something? And he knows he's not. And he says, forbear means be quiet, you prophet. I don't want to hear prophecies about myself. <laughs> See, prophets are okay as long as they're not talking about me. The word of God's okay as long as it's not touching me. Sometimes the word of God's real personal, isn't it? It's like speaking right to me. And it's, I like it better when it's talking to them, Lord. You talk to them. They need this. Oh, I wish so-and-so was here today. He needs to hear this message. Are you a counselor of mine or something? I don't think so. You better be quiet. And he says, why shouldest thou be smitten? In other words, he threatens him. Keep talking. Go ahead, prophet man. Keep talking. Go ahead. Let's see what, 
happens next if you keep opening your mouth. So then the prophet forbear. <laughs> he quit talking. He held his peace. And he said, though, before he completely shut up, he said, well, okay, I know that God hath determined to destroy thee, just saying. I know you don't want to say anything else, but I know God's determined to wipe you out. How's that? Because thou hast done this and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. Yes, I'm a counselor. I'm from the wonderful counselor. And you know what? I'm going to shut up, but you're done. Before I say another thing, it's over for you. <laughs> Don't you love this? You ever had to do this with somebody? You're dealing with somebody? They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear you. You're there for their own good, perhaps. You're there to help them. They don't want to hear it. And you have to come to a place where you say, listen, you're either going to listen to me or you're going to hell. That's your option here. You're going to hear the gospel and hear the truth or your life's over. At the end of this life, you have nothing. And they may tell you, that's enough. Be quiet. You know, keep talking. I'm going to smack you in the mouth. Okay, before I, before I quit, <laughs> you're done. <laughs> your life's over, man. And it might sound, you know, people don't want to say stuff like that. I hear people, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't, I don't want to offend that person. I do. What do you mean you, what do you mean you do? You want to offend them? If that's what it would take to get them saved, yes. Is God going to say to us, yeah, here's the deal. You didn't, you didn't say anything to him. You didn't talk to them. Well, I didn't want to offend them. What's God going to say? I'm offensive. I'm offensive to people who don't want to hear about me. Did Jesus ever offend people? Ooh. How about Paul? How about James? Ooh, James. That guy was an offense. Right? You can't read James and go, yeah, he never offended anybody. Oh, he offended everybody, I think, that he talked to. Read, read the letter, man. People are offended over and over again throughout the scriptures, throughout history. I got saved because I got offended. And I realized I'm the offense. But the word of God's offensive. And this man tells him like it is, okay? You know, it's been compared to being like visiting a doctor, you know, and, and you go to see the doctor because there's something wrong, you think, and the doctor does some tests and, and he finds out you've got, you know, this serious condition, you know, it's life-threatening. It's, it's actually going to take you out. And if it doesn't get treated or get surgery, whatever, it's going to kill you if it doesn't get, but the doctor comes back in and says, well, you know, everything's fine. <laughs> really? Everything's fine? Everything's fine. Have a nice day. What kind of doctor is that? Well, I didn't want to offend him. <laughs> didn't want to offend the poor guy. Well, that's what you're supposed to do, man. Go back in and tell him he's got some offensive thing in his body that needs to be treated, needs to be cut out immediately. If you don't offend him, he's going to die. And this doesn't, listen, don't read this the wrong way. Don't hear me say, Pastor Matt told me to be offensive, so I'm just going to go be offensive to everybody. If you fought... Listen, I don't, have to, I don't have to tell you to do this. If you follow the Lord and you do what he's telling you to do on a daily base, basis, you're going to offend people sometimes. It's going to be offensive at times. You don't have to go out of your way to do it. Be nice, be loving, be gentle, but be truthful. Speak the truth in love, but speak it. 
And this is what this guy did. But he didn't listen. So we see what happened as a result. Now, finishing this up, I'm really, truly, I'm just about there. So Jehoash, verse 16, slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria with kings of Israel. And Jeroboam, his son, that's Jeroboam II, reigned in his stead. And Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived after the death of Jehoash, son of Jehoaz, king of Israel, for 15 years. And the rest of the acts of Amaziah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? We just read that. Now, they made a conspiracy. This is his own people. They made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish, but they sent after him to Lachish and slew him there. So Amaziah is dealt with exactly as his father was. Many believe this was the children of the murderers of his father that he didn't kill. And maybe they were following after their dad's footsteps. But someone conspired against him and, and took him out. Now, interestingly, he flees to Lachish. And this is important for, for a second, at least. Lachish means impregnable or can't be defeated. He, he flees to a place where he doesn't think they can get to him. But they follow after and they kill him there. He did not flee to the presence of God. He fled to a place that he thought was safe. Because that's the name of the place. Safe. <laughs> Can't get me here. Can't touch this. Right? I'm safe. I'm behind the walls of Lachish. You can't get me in here. And God's like, are you crazy? Walls don't protect you. Cities don't protect you. I'm the protector, God would say. And so they came right on in and, and killed him there. Where do you think you can flee? Think you can flee anywhere besides going to the Lord? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we think, well, if this worked out, some people say, look, if, if this job works out, I'm going to be okay. Or if this thing happens, we're going to make it. Well, that's not why you're going to make it. That might be nice, might be convenient, might make more money, might have a savings account, whatever. That is not why, though, life is going to be okay. The only reason that life's okay is because you know God. And if you flee to other things, put your trust in other things, they won't hold up. What, Lachish? Didn't hold up for him. They got him anyway, right? He was defeated. So, it says, and all the people of Judah took Azariah. And now this is, the actual name is Uzziah here. Uzziah should ring bells for some of you in, in your studies. Uzziah was the king that, who knew? Who knew Uzziah? Who starts off the sixth chapter of his prophecy by saying, in the year King Uzziah died, it's Isaiah. So this is King Uzziah being mentioned, the same Uzziah that Isaiah had a relationship with and who grieved when Uzziah died. So this is the first mention. There's going to be a mention of another character that you're going to recognize here in just a second. So this is Uzziah, which was 16 years old, and they made him king instead of his father, Amaziah. So the son of Amaziah was Uzziah, probably one of the best kings Israel ever had in those days, uh, or Judah, rather. So he built Elath and restored it to Judah after that the king slept with his fathers. Now, in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned 40 and one years. Now watch. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. No surprise. Not, not Uzziah, the other king of Israel. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel to sin. I know it's confusing when we say J Israel and then we say Judah, Israel. You're like, which one is it? Israel is in the north, ten tribes. Judah's in the south, two tribes. Just Benjamin and Judah in the south. 
The rest of the tribes are up in the north. So he restores then this man. He restores the coast of Israel from the entering in of Hamath into the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord God, Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of Gath Hepher. This is Jonah, the same Jonah who wrote the book of Jonah. The reluctant prophet, remember? God told him to go speak to the Ninevites, and he said, not a chance. He took a ship the other way. Remember? And he had an encounter with a big fish and all that. Same prophet. Did you know, though, and I know this is a sidebar, but I think it's interesting. To me, at least. You're going to go, well, who cares? But it's interesting to me that many people say that this part of Scripture that we just read through, the reference to Deuteronomy chapter 24 that speaks about how the children aren't to be killed for the sins of the father and, and vice versa. Some people say, well, that's, that's not in here because there are critics who say that the law was inserted long after, much later than the scripture declares. And they say that because they want to denounce the fact that God was the one who initiated law and they want to say that other cultures actually did that. And then the Israelites just brought in this law and said, this is the law of God. It's ridiculous. Because it shows up here in 2 Kings. They have a problem trying to figure that out. They also say that this wasn't the same Jonah. But it's clear, because if you look at Jonah 1, you'll see it's Jonah the son of Amittai, the same guy. Same father, same thing. He's a prophet, all the rest. And the nation at this point, and if you have read through Jonah at all, you'll see this, but the nation at this point was prosperous. They were doing well. They were taking some victories. They had a lot of spoil. They got their, their money back, so to speak, and they were prosperous, but they were sick. And this is a familiar condition, isn't it? Because a, a, a culture is prosperous, doing well, wealthy perhaps, does that mean they're healthy? Is there a, is there moral kind of greatness that associates itself with what wealth and riches? No. In fact, it can be just the opposite. You know, it can be, it can be a covering for, for a sinful condition. And sometimes God blesses a, a, a nation with wealth, but sometimes they're just wealthy and God allows that to be their demise. It's happened over the, the centuries. I think it's interesting in Amos chapter 6, verse 1, just giving us a, a detailed description of this time that they're, they're living out in our study. Uh, Amos says, speaking for the Lord, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came. Pass ye unto Calna and see, and from thence go to Hamath the great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines, be they better than these kingdoms or their border greater than your border? You that put far away the evil day and cause the seed of violence to come near, that lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall, that chant to the sound of viol and invent to themselves instruments of music like David, that drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Therefore now shall they go captive with the first that go captive, and the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. The Lord God hath sworn by himself, saying that the Lord, the God of hosts, he says, I abhor the ex excellency of Jacob. I hate his palaces. Therefore, I will deliver up the city with all that is therein. Amos prophesied about the captivity. First, the Assyrians came in and swept the northern tribes away. And then later, Babylon came and swept away the southern tribes of Judah. The entire nation was taken captive because of their condition. Well, what, well, it seemed like they were doing great. Yeah, they had wealth, they had prosperity, but they were sick. And God says, I hate that. I hate that when wealth makes you spiritually lazy. 
God doesn't just bless people with riches. He gives us life and he gives us the things we need. He never promises us we're going to be wealthy. But for some people, listen, for some people, being wealthy could be the worst thing that's ever happened to them. It was for Israel. It was for Judah. Having all that money was the worst thing could have happened. They would have been better if they were in poverty, but serving the Lord and trusting in God. So that was the condition. They were sick. The people didn't care about anything except for the economy. And, and it, it didn't matter to them that everything was immoral, as long as the economy was good. Does that sound familiar? We live in a very wealthy country. We, you know, we, like the description, we, we get to, you know, eat and drink luxurious things compared to the rest of the world. We really do. You live in homes that are much, much, much nicer than people live in most of this world. We have so much. And yet some people are just sitting around going, yeah, life's not that great. And let me say this. God hates that. He hates it. What God was saying there in Amos was, you have everything possible that you could ever want. You've got wealth and riches and good food and, and all kinds of blessings that you get to enjoy. And, and all you're doing is laying around. And they weren't doing anything to spiritually grow themselves. They were just simply slothful in their wealth, right? Laying there in their, their pool of prosperity. And yet God was like, that stinks, man. <laughs> that is stinky. To whom much is given, much is required. Now, you take that to a personal level. I'm taking it to my own level. I take that to a personal level. You've been given so much, and to whom much is given, much is required. I mean, seriously, this sounds kind of lame. I mean, this is like off the chart if you, if you really think this through. But every day I wake up in a, in a soft, warm, comfortable bed. I should be like rejoicing. Thank you! Right? I'm, I'm not sleeping on the ground. Get up, fry yourself up some bacon and eggs, right? Bacon, I mean, whoa, this is so good. Thank you, Lord, for this. I'm going to go out and bless somebody. I'm going to go out and tell somebody, man, you know what? We're blessed, aren't we? Get other people to experience the same thing. But that's not what happens. I can tell you when, when me and my wife were first married, this was a long time ago now, almost 40 years ago. <laughs> whoa. <laughs> These kids are like, whoa, man. <laughs> so old. Um, but when we got married, we didn't have anything. I mean, literally, we didn't have anything. Everything that I owned, I could fit in the back of my pickup truck. Everything. And we didn't have much. But man, we had fun. We had joy. We would save, we'd save five dollars a month out of what I made and she made, which wasn't a lot at that time. We're living in Rogue River, Oregon. And there was this little Mexican restaurant <laughs> across the river in Rogue River called Poor Jose's. Fitting name for, for us who, who would save that, that five bucks out of the, you know, our pay for the month. And once a month, we'd go to Poor Jose's and we had split, a, they had a $5 special. We would split that. Man, that was a treat. Right? Ooh, that was, wow, that's good. We didn't enjoy life any less. We didn't laugh. In fact, we may have laughed more. We didn't seem to not have purpose. We, we did have purpose. We had 
significant lives. We had things that we enjoyed. We did things. Things were really a blessing when we got them. And there's something pure about that. Something pure about having something and being so grateful and thankful to have it. There's something about it. And there's also something about having so much and not giving a rip about it. In fact, I'm more inclined to complain about, I didn't get that, though. I have all this. I know, I didn't get this. That's going to ruin my day. Huh? You feel like doing that sometimes? You're not to somebody else. There was nobody here. It was my hand. Don't you feel like, wake up, man. Wake up and smell the coffee. Be thankful you have some coffee. <laughs> I'm thankful for coffee every morning, right? I digress. <laughs> but it says that the Lord saw the affliction of Israel after all this, that it was very bitter, for there was not any shut up nor left any, nor any helper for Israel. Everybody was was wasted, that the whole thing was just collapsing. And the Lord saw the affliction, and the Lord said not that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. He saw the condition, and his heart for the people was not to destroy them, but to help them. Because even in their wealth and prosperity, they were miserable. And that's a different form of affliction, isn't it? And God doesn't like affliction for his people in any way, shape, or form. So he helps them. Amazing how gracious he is. So it says, and now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all that he did and his might, how he warred and how he recovered Damascus and Hamath, which belonged to Judah for Israel. And are they not written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? Yep. And Jeroboam slept with his fathers, even with the kings of Israel. And Zechariah, his son, reigned in his stead. You're going to see more of this, the King Uzziah next week, next time. But to sum this up, just remember, God, God is dealing with people on a multitude of levels. And people are, you know, somebody said to me, people are complicated. They are. <clears throat> but people get complicated when they turn away from God. If you stick with the Lord, follow the Lord, pursue the Lord, it's not that complicated. The complication comes through rebellion and running from what God wants you to do and seeking your own ways, strengthening yourself. That's where everything starts to fall apart. And then you've got a complicated situation. And I agree, life is complicated at that point. But God. God's the answer. God's the victor. God's the power. God's the source of all those things. I just want to be grateful to God today. I just want to be thankful to him more and more. I just want to say thanks, God, for, for everything you're doing. I want to appreciate the fact that, you know, I, I can eat food every day. <laughs> right? I can, I can thank him every day for, for so many things. We just 